All right. Good morning. Uh, today, <coughs> sorry. Today we're going to talk about tree models and model ensembles. And this combination is inspired by um, something called uh, gradient-boosted decision trees, which is a particular approach of doing machine learning. So if you were to ask, uh, let's say, a data science specialist or a machine learning researcher, which machine learning model is going to give me the best performance out of the box? You know, if I don't tell you anything about my data, if I don't tell you anything about what I'm working on, I just ask for a sort of overall a priori recommendation of machine learning model, they will either tell you about the no-free lunch principle and tell you that that's not possible, or they will say probably gradient-boosted decision trees will work best. So this is, um, in research, machine learning research, it's not that common a method to, to uh, deal with. It's sort of pretty much worked out. There's not a lot more to say about it. But in production and in things like Kaggle competition, this is a very popular approach, and it combines these two things. It combines the basic idea of a decision tree learner, which we'll talk about in the first half, and the idea of, instead of using one single model, training lots of models and combining them in hopes of making that model stronger, which is a method called ensembling. And that's what we'll talk in the second half. You don't have to do that with decision trees, but it's, uh, for some reason, people tend to use it uh, together with decision trees. Um, so that's all where we'll start. And so decision trees are classification models. And we'll also talk about regression trees, which are regression models. Uh, and then we'll talk about three specific ways of doing ensembling, three specific ways of combining models. The simplest is called bagging. Then there's boosting. There are lots of boosting methods. We'll look at two of them. Ada boost, which is more of a classification boosting method, and gradient boosting, which is used in these gradient boosted decision trees. And then finally, quite briefly, we'll discuss the idea of stacking. So that's the plan for today. Uh, and the nice thing in terms of uh, getting a bit of variation of these decision trees is that they work on categorical features, or I mean they work on both numerical features and categorical features, um, but they're sort of primarily, uh, people tend to work them out first for categorical features and then numeric features are added on as a bit of a hack which is sort of the other way uh, around of how we usually do it. So that makes a nice change. So we'll start with a, a data set with categorical features. And usually around this time of year, it's uh, nice and relevant to talk about the Oscars. So let's do that. Here we have a data set of uh, movies. Every instance, every row in this table is a movie. Uh, and we have three features. The rating, whether it's rated for children, PG, for a general audience, up to teenagers, or it's R-rated, so it contains uh, lots of violence and swearing. The genre, sci-fi, drama, or romance. And the aspect ratio, that's uh, the uh, aspect ratio of the, the screen format. Um, and then we have three classes that we like to predict, whether it was overlooked for the Oscars, so nobody mentioned it, it was nominated, but it didn't win an Oscar, or it won an Oscar. So that's sort of our basic data set, which we'll use as a running example. And the way a decision tree um, looks, for now we'll uh, uh, just first describe the model and then describe how to learn a decision tree. We've seen decision trees a lot, uh, a couple of times already, but just to uh, repeat, this is what a decision tree looks like. So it's a tree, obviously. Uh, the squares are nodes, or the rectangles are nodes. And at every node, it picks a feature, and it asks what the value of that feature is. So at the root node, it asks, what is the genre of your movie? If it's romance, go down this uh, arc, this edge. If it's drama, go down this edge. If it's sci-fi, go down this edge. So you say, okay, it's romance. Then it asks, what is the rating? And you say, well, 
it's a PG rated romance. So you go down here and then on the leaf node, the note that doesn't have any children, on the leaf node you will see uh, there will be uh, a label and that's the label we output as a classification. So if we have a PG rated romance, we say that it's, uh, we predict that it will be nominated but it will not win. Or, uh, yeah, I actually have a slide for that. So if we get some new instance, which is a G-rated drama film with a 2.39 aspect ratio, <coughs> then first we ask the genre, which is drama. So we end up in this note. Then we ask the aspect ratio, which is 239. So we predict that this movie will win an Oscar. Uh, so that's how the model works once it's trained. So now the question is, given a data set like this um, Oscar data set, how do we train a model, uh, how do we train a tree? How do we get a tree that fits the data set well? And the standard algorithm, <coughs> which goes by the names of ID3 or C45, the specific details aren't that important, it's just the canonical uh, decision tree learning algorithm. Basically, it starts with an empty tree. It finds a good feature to split on. And then it sort of extends it step by step. So after one, after you've decided the root node, you get three leaves. And then you try and expand each of these three leaves, or however many leaves. Uh, <coughs> you try and expand them with new splits, new features to split on. And you keep doing that. Uh, you do it greedily. So once you've extended the tree, there's no going back. There's no removing nodes. Once you've extended it, that's it. Uh, and you try and look for splits that at that point in the data set create the least uniform distribution over the class labels in the resulting segmentation. So you sort of end up at the end of your split with three segmentations of your data set, three subsets of your data set. And within those subsets, <coughs> and we'll look at this in more detail later, but within those subsets, the idea is that you want uh, the least uniform distribution of classes. I'll show you an example. So for our data set, Let's say we're training a decision tree. So we have to uh, decide what the first split is going to be. The first node in our tree, what feature is it going to ask about? Uh, so I've um, shown just two of the features here. So we have genre and rating. The other one we'll ignore for now. And our data falls apart in these, uh, which they both have three categories. So our data falls apart in this grid of nine by nine. And in each grid, we get a number of classes for, uh, sorry, a number of instances for each class. So for instance, if we have a sci-fi movie that is PG rated, then we have four overlooked and one nominated in that, for that uh, sort of subcategory of our data. <coughs> so let's see now, uh, oh yeah, and uh, before we split over the, so in this case, over the whole data set, this is our proportion of the classes. Right? That's mostly overlooked mo uh, and then about equal between nominated and one. <coughs> so let's see what happens if we split on rating first. Essentially, what we do is we cut our data set into these three segments. Uh, and then what I've done here is I've annotated at the bottom of each leaf what the class proportion is after we've split in those three segments. So the segment here is all movies uh, rated G. Uh, and there are seven overlooked movies in that, uh, in that row of the table. There are four nominated and three ones. And basically what you can see here is that this is not a very good split. Because the uh, relative proportions of every class after we've made the split at every leaf are roughly the same as they were before. So there's fewer movies, but if you uh, sum this up and divide this by one, sum this up and divide by one, you get roughly the same proportions. So knowing the rating of a movie doesn't actually tell us very much about whether or not, uh, about the distribution of the classes. Because it doesn't change after we split the data set by its rating. Whereas if we split by genre, so we divide the data set like this and group these things together, what we see, for instance, is that 
if a movie is science fiction, then there are no wins in this part of the data set. So we know that once we split and we end up in this part of the tree here under the science fiction uh, label, we basically know that it's a very bad idea to predict a win. Because the in the data set there are no wins, so probably the probability of a win is very, very low. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for proportions of classes at the bottom at this leaf that are very different, uh, that are very non-uniform, and ideally also very different from the proportion above. But mostly what we're looking for is non-uniformity, because if we have a non-uniform distribution that tells us something about which classes are uh, likely to be true and which classes are not likely to be true. <coughs> so we split by genre, and then we can split again by rating after that, uh, which means we end up with this kind of split of our uh, data. And as I said before, this uh, little square here, which corresponds to one of the leaves in our current tree, we call that a segment. Our instance space is segmented into uh, segments. And for each segment, we choose a particular uh, class. So, so this tree assigns to each of these uh, five segments, corresponding to five leaf nodes, we assign a particular class until we split the tree again, and then we get more segments and more leaf nodes. Uh, two things to note about this process of, of sort of extending the tree step by step. Um, we choose a new split for every single leaf that we expand. So if we start by expanding genre and then we expand the, this leaf and then we expand this leaf, we uh, may select different features to split on at different levels of the node. So on the left we may uh, choose rating, but it may well be that for the instances that end up here, aspect is a better split. That's possible. Second thing to note is that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you have categoric features, if you have categoric features, to split twice on the same um, on the same feature. And by twice I mean uh, in a path from the root to the leaf to encounter the same feature twice. So you can split by rating here and by rating here. That makes sense. But it doesn't make sense to split by genre here and go down the tree and split by genre again. Uh, because these leaf nodes to the left and to the right will be empty. Because we've, uh, oh, no, sorry. The green and the purple leaf node will be empty here. Because we've already split by genre. So any instance that end up, ends up in this part of the tree here on the left, we know will be the yellow genre. Uh, G, I think, whatever it was. Uh, so this won't tell us anything, splitting again. So once you're out of all the features in this sense, uh, you're done. Uh, yeah, so that brings us to the stop condition. So wh when do you stop extending the tree? In the basic algorithm, either when all the inputs are the same, so there are no more features left to split on, then you have to stop because there's no more splits possible, or when all the outputs are the same. So if, if after a split, for every leaf resulting from the split, all the um, instances in that segment have the same class, then you can stop. Because you just label it with that class, and you're done. So usually these are the two stop conditions. You keep extending, 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 until you uh, hit one of these two stop conditions for all your leaves, and then you're done, and that's your decision tree. So now all we have to do is make it a little bit more precise what we mean by this non-uniformity. How we decide which of the features gives us the least uniform distribution after we've made the split. Um, and that can be difficult sometimes. I mean, if you have two classes, then it's easy. They both have equal proportions, then it's very uniform. And the bigger one of the classes is, the less uniform it is. But if you have three classes, it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, for instance, here on the top, the red class is overrepresented, and uh, uh, orange and blue classes are uh, take up sort of uh, both take up equal shares of the remainder. So that's quite ununiform. 
but on the bottom, the red class takes a little bit less of the pro uh, probability, so in that sense, it's a little bit less uniform. But on the other hand, the blue is much, much smaller. So which of these two are we going to call the least uniform distribution? Uh, and in order to make that precise, we need to look back to the probability one lecture of a few weeks ago, where we talked about entropy. Starting with this slide, this is the formula. <coughs> I won't go into it. Look back to the uh, lecture if you want to know why the formula looks like this. But for now, we'll just say entropy uh, is a measure of uniformity of a distribution. So if we have two distributions here, we measure the entropy. This, this distribution on the left, which is entirely uniform, has an entropy of two bits, which means that if we encode these events, A, B, C, or D, uh, using an optimal code, then we will spend, uh, we expect to spend two bits per thing that we uh, encode. Whereas this on the right, uh, this distribution on the right is highly non-uniform. And if we compute its entropy, we see that it has a much lower entropy because its non-uniformity allows us to transmit things more efficiently. We can assign A a short code word, so our expected code length uh, shrinks. And that's sort of the intuition that we're after. Because if we see this kind of distribution in our split, this kind of distribution in our split, we um, also, uh, we, uh, yeah, we know more for the distribution on the right than for the distribution on the left, which on the one hand tells us we can encode it more efficiently, but it also tells us we have more information about which class is more likely. So if we're in some segment of instance space where the classes are distributed like this, then we know that the red class is much more likely, so this is a good situation to be in. We want segments with low entropy. Uh, and in order to uh, work that into our algorithm, we need to first deal with a subject called conditional entropy. So we need to work our definition of entropy into conditional entropy, which isn't very complicated. So if you have a conditional distribution, the class given some feature, so here the probability that the outcome is uh, it's an Oscar winner given that the genre is drama. Uh, we can talk about the entropy of this conditional distribution. So this is not a conditional entropy, this is just an entropy. But it just happens that we're taking the entropy over a distribution on a condition on something. So we just take the uh, this probability distribution, PO given D, uh, and we take the expected uh, logarithm over all values of O. That's just a, an entropy, but it just happens to be conditioned on D. And if we now average this entropy over all values of G, weighing each value of G by the um, joint probability of uh, O and G, that's called the conditional, uh, conditional entropy. So it's just we have sort of three different entropies here, or uh, yeah, three different entropies for all the different values of, D, of G. And we basically weigh each the, uh, we weigh them by this uh, joint probability. And that gives us the information gain of a particular feature G. So the information gain of G is the uh, the information gain of the outcome O, so the information gain for the labels, for the class labels, of the feature G, is the um, <coughs> generic entropy, sort of the entropy before we've seen the feature, minus the entropy after we've seen the feature. So how much do we gain by knowing the value of the feature? How much information do we gain by the no knowing the value of the feature? And if you fill that into our decision tree uh, classifier um, algorithm, it looks like this. <coughs> so let's say before we hit this node, this is one node, <coughs> could be the root node, could be a node in a large, somewhere in a large tree. So let's say before we hit the node, uh, S is our segment, which has this distribution of classes. So these are all the, this is a set of all the instances that hit this part of the tree. And then we split on genre, 
and we get three new segments, SR, SD, and SS. With these um, class proportions, and then the information gain of the feature G for the segment S works out this way. So we compute the entropy of S here at the top, <coughs> where we just convert the uh, where we take the probability of each class uh, just as the um, the relative frequency. So the probability of the red class is 23 over the sum uh, over the size of S. So we compute the entropy of S, and what we subtract is this entropies, the sum of the entropies of all these uh, resulting segments at the bottom, all these, these three resulting segments, each weighed by the proportion of instances that they claim. So what we see is that SR claims a lot more instances than SS. So the entropy of SR weighs a little bit more in this sum than the entropy of the others. And this value, when we compute it, is our information gain. And the higher our information gain, the more this feature lowers the entropy be between this set S and these uh, lower sets at the bottom, the better we consider our splits. So we just compute this for all possible features, and then we pick the one that has the highest information gain. And that's how we grow the tree. So here, a little bit with a little bit more precision, is the algorithm again. We start with an unlabeled leaf. And we uh, loop until all leaves are labeled. But first, for each unlabeled leaf with segment S, if there's a stop condition, if it's uh, so, if either we're out of features or we're out of uh, we're out of features, or all instances have the same class, then we just stop it and we label it with the majority class of S. If not, then we split L leaf L, so we uh, make it not a leaf anymore by splitting it on feature F with the highest gain, uh, with the highest information gain. And we keep doing that until we hit the stop condition, so then all uh, leaves become uh, either labeled or they become split. So there are a few variations that we should talk about uh, to deal with special cases. First one is what to do if you have numeric features. Uh, how do you split a numeric feature? It's relatively simple. So here we see a, a little visualization. Imagine this line represents the numeric value of this one numeric feature. Then all of the instances that we encounter will be somewhere along that line. And what we do is we make a binary split by picking a threshold. And everything that is below the threshold goes in one direction, like here, SB is below, and everything that is above the threshold goes in the other direction. And then we simply choose the threshold <coughs> to maximize the information gain. So you know the threshold has to be somewhere between one of these features, uh, sorry, between one of these instances, and in fact it has to be between two instances of different classes. So you check all those points, you compute the information gain for all of them, and you pick the threshold that gives you the highest information gain. Uh, so we saw this actually already. A uh, uh, decision tree classifier with numeric features in the first lecture looked like this. So what you see here is that the in this numeric space, your decision boundary will become this kind of sort of step function aligned, by, aligned with the axis because these uh, the segments of your instance space sort of run like this. You split first on height, and then within the resulting segments, you split either. Uh, you split on uh, distance between the shoulder blades. And if you do this in sklearn, as we saw, uh, it actually looks a lot more complicated. <coughs> so you might ask yourself, how can you get such a complicated decision boundary if you have a decision tree with just two features? That's because when you have numeric features, it does make sense to split twice on the same feature. Because you can split, second time you split, you can split on a different threshold. So what you see here is a tree that splits lots and lots of times on the height, but every time it splits on a different threshold. 
So that's why uh, with numeric features you can get much bigger and much more complicated trees. Uh, which we're going to uh, uh, we're going to look at now, uh, because these really big and complicated trees they lead to overfitting. What you see here is a plot from a book called uh, Machine Learning by Tom Mitchell, um, and what uh, what he's plotted is the uh, he's run a number of decision tree learning experiments, and every time he's limited artificially limited the maximum size of the tree. So sort of adding another stop condition. If the tree gets too, if the leaf gets too deep, then also you're not allowed to extend it anymore. And with that algorithm for different uh, maximum tree depths, he's trained uh, on a particular data set uh, and measured the training accuracy, the accuracy on the training data, and the accuracy on the test data or validation data. And what you see is that as your tree grows, your accuracy goes up and up and up and up, your training accuracy. So at first you might think that's good, but then when you take that tree and you test it on data that you haven't seen during training, actually it, you see that the test uh, accuracy decays massively because your tree is massively overfitting. It's not generalizing, it's not learning anything about the data, it's memorizing the data. Uh, which uh, decision trees are very likely to do. So we need to, because we do this grady, uh, grady uh, extension of the tree, so we need to sort of mitigate that. And the standard way of doing that is by pruning. Uh, pruning is an English word for uh, cutting a tree. So you can sort of imagine what this is going to look like. Basically, once we've trained our tree, we withhold some validation data before we train. And we train our whole tree. And then we go uh, upwards from the leaves. And for every leaf we encounter, we ask the question, does this tree classify better on the validation data with or without the leaf? Uh, so it's not the leaf as in this, but the leaf as in the highest split. For every split you encounter from the bottom up, does the tree classify better or worse? Uh, does the tree classify better with or without this split, and if it classifies better without, you remove the split. And you keep going back up and up the tree until you no longer encounter any splits that you can remove in this way. And that way you prune the tree and you, uh, you help against overfitting. Uh, and if you do this kind of thing, you're basically using uh, a validation set with how you're using withheld data to guide your model search. There's a couple of other uh, places where this happens as well. Like in neural networks, sometimes you have early stopping where you decide to stop your training early if your model seems to be doing pretty well on validation data. Uh, which you can do, and it works very well, but you have to be careful that you're basically using uh, your validation data for different things. So essentially what you want to be doing is first you split your data into training, validation, and test, where test is only for final testing. So you move that to the side and you only look at it at the end of your project. Then you use this orange data set for hyperparameter selection, which includes model selection. So whether you want to use a decision tree at all, whether you want to use a neural network, if you use a neural network, how many layers should it have, what should my learning rate be, all these kinds of things. But then for specific models, like decision trees, if you want to control the search, you should split again. Because otherwise it's not fair. If you have a decision tree algorithm that is allowed to control its search using this validation data, and uh, a k-nearest neighbor that is not allowed to control its search using this, na using this validation data, then essentially you're allowing one of your models to see the validation data before it has to deliver, before it has to say, this is the model that's come out of my search process. Uh, so you have to do this sort of inception, like splitting again and again and again uh, for different parts of your learning process. So keep that in mind if you ever do this kind of thing. It doesn't matter if you do this in sklearn. So if you tell sklearn, give me a decision tree and do some pruning, then it will sort of underwater, under the hood, it will 
withhold some training data during the training process to do the pruning. And that will be part of the training set that you feed it. So then it doesn't matter, but you have to sort of keep this in mind and make sure this doesn't go wrong. Uh, so that's a way we can combat overfitting. Uh, so the last, oh yeah, that's actually part of the plan, so I can mark it here. So that's decision trees. So now the question is, what do you um, do if your target label is not a class, but a number? Then you need a regress regression tree. So let's uh, tweak our data set a little bit. This time we're not predicting whether or not we won an Oscar, but we are predicting what the box office uh, figures are. So how many, how much money did it earn at the box office? Uh, otherwise, features are the same. So we're sticking with the um, categorical features for now, but we're trying to predict the number. Uh, so we use the same basic principle as the decision trees, but there's a couple of things, a couple of questions that we need to answer. Firstly is how do we label the leaves? So assume we have some tree and it splits in some ways. We end up with a segment for every leaf. And within that segment, instead of getting a bunch of classes, we get a bunch of numbers. And whereas with the classes, they were a lot of them were the same, these numbers usually are all different. So once we hit the leaf in a tree, how do we label it? What uh, once we end up uh, an instance ends up here? How are we going to? What are we going to predict as a value for that instance? Um, well, the obvious answer is just to take the mean. If there's more than one instance in the segment, then we want to stop anyway. We just take the mean of these values, uh, or the median. Sometimes depends on your loss function, but uh, there's nothing really uh, very special to uh, to do here. So we just take the mean. Uh, then how we decide, how do we decide which feature to split on at every step of growing this tree? Um, we can't use entropy because we have a bunch of different numbers. So the basic computation of entropy doesn't apply. Uh, but the basic principle that we used earlier does apply, which is that we want to maximize our surprise in a way. We want the... Um, variation and the uniformity within these seg segments to be as little as possible. So if we get a bunch of numbers that are very far apart, spread out over a large range, then we don't really know what to label this segment. Whereas if we get a bunch of numbers that are in a very small range, then we can be sure, well, we might get it a little bit wrong, but at least within that range, it's pretty, we're pretty sure that that's where the answer is. So that's what we want. We want numbers. Uh, in a particular range, and that happens if we use, uh, if we basically just replace entropy by variance. So the information gained for a bunch of numbers is just the variance, the weighted variance of, uh, of all the different segments, and that's what we maximize. Uh, yeah, we maximize the information gain. And then if you do that, uh, you get something like this. So here's a, a regression tree on one feature, but it's a numeric feature, so we can split again and again and again. And what it does essentially, it segments your instance space into lots of little small segments. And for each, it applies the mean value of all the instances in that segment. So you get this kind of stepwise thing. And if you do it in multiple dimensions, uh, it looks sort of like this. Uh, well, for once we might have to break a little early today. I don't have that many more slides. Um, so this gives you uh, what I've called in this slide a generalization hierarchy for your model space. So this is something that you see a lot in machine learning algorithms. So it's uh, worthwhile to think about a little bit. Basically, if you look at the entire model space of, of uh, models of trees that you can end up with, At the top, you have the sort of most generalizing model, by which I mean the model that remembers the least about your data, that compresses your data the most, which is just a constant function. You don't even have a tree. You just have a, a single leaf node, which outputs just, in the case of a regression tree, the mean over your entire data. Then if you add one split, 
you end up with what's called a, a decision stump or a regression stump, depending on what you're doing, which is just a, a, a tree with one node, with one split. And then after the split, you uh, add the means of the uh, different segments. And these stumps by themselves aren't very good, but they are very useful when we get to uh, ensembling. They are very useful as an ensembling method. And these are all at the, the top of this generalization hierarchy. You get very high bias models and low variance models. So you get the same result every time. There's not a lot of variance, but they tend to get it very, very wrong. They're just not very strong. They don't have very high capacity, and they tend to underfit. Whereas if you grow the tree on the, uh, to the sort of full size, you get overfitting, as we saw, and you get low bias, so it fits your data very precisely, but you do get high variance. If your data changes just a little bit, you get an entirely different tree and an entirely different fit. Um, and a lot of model families that you see in machine learning are sort of laid out in this way, have this kind of internal hierarchy where you have to choose between a very high generalizing model and a very uh, high overfitting model. And ideally, to make your bias variance trade-off, you want to be somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's, that's decision trees and regression trees. They're not um, by themselves as a single model. They're not really that popular anymore, uh, because uh, mostly because of these uh, instability issues and, and high variance issues. Uh, so sometimes people will grow a single decision tree as a kind of uh, baseline learner, but usually what we do is we grow a bunch of uh, decision or regression trees and we put them together in a model, which is called predictably a decision forest or a regression forest. And that's what we call an ensemble, a combination of different models, and that's what we'll talk about after a bit. So let's take 15 minutes and then we'll go through these ensembling methods. All right, so uh, we talked about decision trees and we um, discussed that they uh, worked okay but um, have some problems, so it's best to uh, train a couple of decision trees and combine them. That's called ensembling. You don't have to do it with decision trees. You can do it with any machine learning model but it's popular to do in combination with decision trees. And the problems that uh, ensembling solves are bias and variance, which brings us back to the uh, bias-variance decomposition that we saw in methodology one or two, I think two, uh, one. Uh, so uh, the idea of bias and variance is that bias is a kind of structural problem. So bias... Uh, Imagine if you imagine that you could sample another data set and another data set and you could sort of look at the average uh, errors that you get, then a high bias, low variance situation, where is it? High bias, low variance situation is where all the classifiers that you train or all the models that you train do exactly roughly the same thing, but that thing is not very good. That thing is wrong. So that's a high bias classifier or high bias regression model. And the opposite, low bias, high variance, is if the average of all your models is really, really good, uh, but they're very spread out. So sometimes they have a big error this way and sometimes they have a big error the other way. Um, and of course, in reality, if you just train one model, you don't really know. Um, oh yeah, I had a, sorry, I had an instructive example. So. Um, what we do in this course when we grade your projects, we have a similar sort of problem. Uh, because if we grade you in a very automated way, like a rubric, you just follow a sort of computer program to grade a, pro to grade a, a, a project uh, paper. What you get is high bias, because you get very consistent results. That's why rubrics are good, because you get consistent results. Everybody's graded in exactly the same way. But rubrics are a bit stupid. They're like computer programs. They can't look at your code and see that you documented it really well or uh, see that you made a web page for your project or see there's lots of things that you can do well that the rubric didn't think of or lots of things that you can do not well that the rubric that we didn't think of when we made the rubric. So what you get is high bias, low variance. 
so the same result every time, but that might not be a very good result. Whereas if you grade by TA, these are humans, they're very smart, they're very uh, perceptive, so they can notice different things. They can notice that you documented your code well, which wasn't part of the rubric, but um, it depends on the TA whether or not they notice. So what you get is a, a good chance that you will, everything will get noticed, but also it might not, so you get high variance. And what we do in this course, because uh, we can't grade multiple times, we sort of combine the rubric and the TA to sort of make a little bit of a trade-off. That's how you can think of bias and variance. And I draw this in terms of this dartboard analogy. It's like you can see what the, uh, w which case it is, whether you have high bias or, or high variance if you throw multiple darts at this dartboard. But of course, you don't have multiple darts. You have one data set, and you train one model, and you get one performance measure. So you only get one dart, and if you throw one dart, you don't know whether the distance to the target is because of high bias or because of high variance, whether you have systemic error or uh, high variance. Um, so in order to uh, figure that out, what we talked about in the uh, earlier methodology lecture is a method called bootstrapping. Uh, basically, the problem is we don't have multiple data sets. We can't sample another data set to train on. And what bootstrapping does, it simulates that process by sampling another data set from the data set that you already have. So you just resample your own data set. You sample bits from your data set with replacement. So you sample it and then put it back, and then there's a probability that you'll sample the same thing again. And you sample until your uh, sample data set has the same size as the old data set. That's called a bootstrap sample. Uh, what you end up with is a data set with, on average, about 63% of the original data set included, and the rest is made up of uh, duplicate instances. Um, and then you have a kind of uh, sample which you can treat as coming from your distribution that your original data came from. And that's not just intuitive, uh, that's not just intuition. Uh, we can actually have a look at uh, what's happening here. So let's say we have data sampled, so one feature, one numeric feature sampled from a normal distribution. And we will plot in these slides the uh, cumulative probability density function, which is just for this particular point here, the red point, uh, how much of the probability mass of the uh, probability density function is below that point. So what's the size of the red area? And as we move to the right, the red area gets bigger and bigger and converges to one. So that's called the cumulative density function. Uh, and that's instructive in, in showing us what's, what we're doing, what we're actually sampling from when we're resampling our data. So let's say we take five samples from the probability density function. Oh, sorry, we take five samples from the original distribution. So that's our data set. We now have a data set of five samples. When we now resample, we take, we pick at random one of these five samples. What probability distribution are we then sampling from? That's this green line. That's called the empirical distribution. Uh, so what you see here in the cumulative uh, density function that as you move to the right, uh, the probability of everything on your left stays zero until you hit one of your data points. Then after that, it's one-fifth until you hit the second part of your data point, and then it's two-fifths and so on. And what you see as you uh, sample more and more data, so let's sample 50 points instead, uh, you see that the this curve, this empirical curve, uh, distribution, the cumulative density function of your empirical distribution, starts hugging the cumulative density function of the source of your data. And once we hit 500 points, it's almost indistinguishable. So this is sort of, this allows us to say that when we resample our own data, we are approximating sampling from our original data distribution because we're sampling from the empirical distribution, especially if we have big data sets. And we can now 
uh, now let's say we have a model with high variance. What we can now do is we can sample different data sets from this uh, empirical distribution function and train a model on each one of them. So instead of training one model on all of our data, we resample data sets, and then for each resample data set, we train a model. And that's called bootstrap aggregating. So we take bootstrap samples, we resample k data sets, and on each of them, we train a model. And that's our first ensemble. And then we just, when we uh, get an instance to classify, after we've trained all these k models, when we get an instance to classify, we just ask our entire bag of uh, classifiers, what they would say, and then we take a majority vote. Or if we want class probability, we can use relative frequencies among the votes, but let's stick with majority vote for now. So what you see, let's do that for a linear classifier on this data. So we resample this data a couple of times, and for each resample we train another, a new linear classifier, so we might get something like this. Broadly the same, but every uh, classifier is slightly different. And if you look at the majority vote among these classifiers, what you see is that this becomes your decision boundary. Because here in this blue area, more of the classifiers say that it sh should be blue than say it should be red, which means that our actual decision boundary is not a line, but is a piecewise linear uh, decision boundary. So we actually have a more, uh, more expressive model. Um, and if you do this with uh, decision trees, then it's called a random forest. And usually when you do this with decision trees, you don't just subsample the data, you also subsample the features. Because what you want uh, in, in bagging and in, in most ensembling is for the um, models in the ensemble to do different things, to be decorrelated, to be less related, uh, as little related to each other as possible. And with decision trees, you have the problem that if one feature is very, um, gives you a very high information gain compared to the other features, and even if you train a big ensemble on lots of resampled data, they're all at first going to split on that one high value feature. So you don't get actually a lot of variation in your ensemble. So in order to eliminate that, you subsample the features so that some of your models are not allowed to see that feature. Um, so that works very well. It's, it's a very nice uh, algorithm because um, well, it works to reduce the variance. There's not a lot of hyperparameters because how big your ensemble should be. And um, that's usually as big as you can make it uh, without filling up your memory or uh, wearing out your patience. And it's very easy to parallelize because everything is trained in parallel. So you can resample your data and, and do, all of, do it all in parallel. And then you get your, uh, your ensemble. The only drawback is that it doesn't reduce bias. This kind of bagging uh, approach, it really only reduces variance. And if you have a high bias model or a high bias family of models, then bagging is not going to help you with that. So after bagging took off, that led to the question, is there a different way of doing ensembling that can help us with high bias models? The hypothesis boosting question. The hypothesis in this sense means just models. So uh, can we boost a weak model family, a family of weak learners, learners with high bias that don't get very good accuracy on the data? but do get slightly better than chance, can we boost this model family to, get, to lower this bias? Um, and the answer is yes, which brings us to boosting and why it's called boosting. Um, and the basic principle of most boosting methods is uh, fairly straightforward. So we take our data set and we add a little column, which we call the weight. Uh, which uh, sort of um, indicates at a, per at, at a particular point in our learning process how important we find each feature. And then the sort of general idea of most boosting methods is this. Uh, 
we start with some classifier M0, which could be anything, could be a linear classifier, could, uh, it's often a constant model, so it's just a model that outputs a constant, or outputs a majority class. And then we sequentially train classifiers. So starting with M1, we, uh, let's come back to this later. So starting with M1, we look at what the classifiers we have so far, so just M0 now, we look at which instances they get wrong, and we increase the weight for those instances, and we decrease the weight for the instances they get right. And then we train a new classifier on the reweighted data, and we give the classifier a weight based on how important we think it is, based on how much of an improvement we think it gives us. Uh, and then we add that to our ensemble. And our ensemble is then the sum of this M0 model plus every model we've trained times its, uh, its weight. So now the question is how do you train on reweighted data? If you have a, the same data set but you give every uh, instance different weights, how do you train on that? Uh, well, if you have a loss function that you optimize in your training, you can just weight your loss function because the loss function is almost always a sum of uh, a sum over your data. So you can usually just insert a little weight there. Uh, you can do that in a more principled approach, in a more principled way that we'll see with, with AdaBoost, but this is sort of the basic idea. You just consider certain examples more important to your loss function than others. If you don't have a particular loss function that you're optimizing, like in regression trees, they don't really optimize, maybe implicitly they optimize a loss function, but we don't really write down the loss function and then work out an algorithm to minimize that. Um, then you can just resample by the weights. So instead of training on all your data, you train on resample data sets, which is just uh, resampled by the weights. So that would be a sort of simple ad hoc way to do uh, boosting. Um, and that's your, the basic approach of boosting. So you just, you see which elements it, uh, the last classifier got wrong and you give those more weights when you train the next classifier. And then at the end, you sum up all the classifiers and weigh them by how well they did. Um, which is, uh, is, is very nice, works very well, but you have a lot of sort of open questions about exactly how to do this. So we'll look at AdaBoost, which is one of the more principled approaches of doing this. Uh, so first, a little notation, how we set things up with AdaBoost. We, uh, it's a, we'll stick with binary classification for now. So we have a positive class and a negative class. And we'll define the learners, we'll uh, uh, require the learners to output a number, uh, which is minus one for the negative class and plus one for the positive class. And we also have some target values, y, i, which are also these labels, minus one for the negative class, one for the positive class. Then we train one of these model ensembles. We'll look at the details later. But because it's this weighted uh, sum of a bunch of classifiers, we actually get values between 0 and 1. So the individual classifiers that we train, the lowercase m1s, they all output either minus 1 or minus 1. But the mixture, the ensemble, can output values between minus 1 and plus 1. So this is our mixture, uh, which we can also write sort of recursively. So model T is model T minus 1 plus the next model, weighted by this weight AT. So it's just a bit of notation. And now we define an error function in yellow here, which ADA boost is going to minimize, which is... Uh, so for this next model, not the uh, previous model, but the next model that we're, at, um, let me say it properly. So let's say we're somewhere in this learning process. We have an ensemble already. We've trained T minus one models already. And now we're going to do two things. We're going to train the next model, MT, and we're going to work out what the weight for a MT should be, which is AT. And to do that, we're going to minimize the error and the error is defined like this. So we multiply the uh, output of the uh, 
next step in the ensemble, the one we're going to produce, uh, we multiply it by y, by minus, uh, we multiply it by y, and then we take the negative exponential of that. So essentially, if y is positive, so then y is 1, and mt is very good, so it outputs something very positive. And this part is positive, so uh, we take the uh, exponential of something near minus 1, so we end up here in the exponential curve. We get a very low error. Whereas if they don't agree, so MT outputs something very high, let's say, something very positive, so very close to 1, and YI is uh, minus 1, then this thing becomes minus 1, and we get exp uh, E to the power of 1, so we end up here with a high error. Uh, and this is just a loss function. There's not, no real reason that I could figure out why exactly it's chosen like this. This is just a sort of a choice for... Uh, Mostly, it seems to make the math work out, but it, it seems like a reasonable loss function. Uh, so that's for every uh, instance in our data set, we compute this EIT. And if we sum it over all the data set, we get the error over our entire data set. So this is the error of our data set for the next step in our model ensemble, which we're going to try to minimize. So we, now we're going to choose MT and AT to minimize this value. Uh, so let's rewrite this a little bit. If we insert here for capital MT this recursive function, we see that this is MT minus 1, our ensemble so far, plus this new model that we're going to select. So we can work this Y inside the sum and then work the sum, uh, split the sum over the two exponents. We get the exponent for this, basically the error so far times the error specific to our new, um, our new model that we're going to train. And we call this the weight. The error so far, we call the weight. And this thing is what we're going to minimize. And then, well, this whole value is what we're going to minimize by choosing uh, uh, m first. We're going to choose m first. So if we want to minimize this value, and I'm taking some shortcuts here, so I hope you can s follow along with the rough idea. Um, we can split this sum over the uh, instances for which the classifier empty is correct and for which it's incorrect. And if it's correct, we end up with... Because empty outputs just either minus 1 or plus 1. So if it's correct, we get e to the power of minus at. If it's incorrect, we get e to the power of at. Um, so this e to the power of something, that's just a constant. That doesn't depend on, uh, on the instance. So we can work that outside of the sum. And then we give these sums. So these sums are now just the sums over the weights uh, of the incorrect, the, the weights of the incorrectly classified instances and the weights of the correctly classified instances. So let's give those some names to make the notation easier. We call the correctly classified instances WC the incorrectly classified ones, wi. And now we want to minimize this value, which is the same as minimizing this value, because these EITs are just constants, so we can just work that to the other side. It becomes a different function, but minimizing it is the same. And we can rewrite this function into this. Uh, which, uh, if you look at all these gray bits, they're all just constants. So the sum of the correctly and incorrectly classified weights, that's just the sum of all the weights in our data. So that doesn't depend on what the classifier does, because these weights were determined by our ensemble so far. So we can ignore this if we're minimizing this value. And this EAT minus 1 we can also ignore, because that's also a constant. So the takeaway here is that in order to minimize these errors, all we have to do is minimize the sum weight of the incorrectly classified uh, data, uh, the sum weight of the incorrectly classified instances. That's all ADA boost does. We, so when we're choosing our next classifier, our next uh, classifier in the ensemble, 
that's just our loss function. We get some weights from the ensemble so far, and all we're doing, we're choosing our next classifier to minimize the weights, some weights of the incorrectly classified examples by lowercase mts. So now we have to choose A, the weight of this new classifier. And again, we choose A to minimize this uh, total error of the uh, next step in our ensemble. Uh, and here we just take the derivative, uh, which works out this way. So WC and WI don't depend on AT. So they fall out of the derivative. Uh, the derivative of the exponential function is very simple. So here it just st stays the ex exponential function on the right. And on the left, we get minus the exponential function. So we just set this value equal to 0. And if you rewrite that around a little bit, you end up with this value for AT. So I, like I said, I took a couple of shortcuts, a couple of quick steps. If you want to see the details, you can click on this link. Um, but this is basically where the values in Ada Boost come from. So that gives us, for Ada Boost this algorithm. So to train some, um, an ensemble, start with some classifier M0. We look at our ensemble so far. We use that to compute some weights for every instance in our data. And we compute it in this way. Wi is this function. Uh, then we train a new classifier mt to minimize the number of incorrect the weight some of the weights of the incorrect classifications, and that particular classifier gets the weight at which is computed like this. We do that for k steps, and then mk is our final model. So that's Ada Boost, uh, Ada Boost, which is a very popular boosting method for classification models, uh, and this kind of boosting. The nice thing oh, sorry, is that it works even if our uh, individual models are very, very poor. If they're so-called weak classifiers, so classifiers that uh, classify only a little bit better than chance. So if you have a balanced, uh, balanced, balanced binary data set, uh, a classifier that gives you 51% accuracy is already good enough. And you can still use boosting to uh, turn those weak classifiers into a strong classifier. For instance, you can do this with decision stumps, and that works. Uh, that can work very well. And there's a couple of other variants like logit boost and brown boost that we don't won't talk about. And if you compare bagging to boosting for this kind of uh, uh, for linear classifiers on a very nonlinear data set, what you see is that if you resample this data set just sort of uniformly as we do in bagging, you'll get some different classifiers, but the there's not going to be a lot of variation, right? Roughly, they will, sim they will generally pick roughly the same, uh, um, the same area. So if there's not a lot of variance in your models, then there won't be a lot of variance in your ensemble. Whereas with boosting, because you're reweighing your data, so you start out with this line, and then you're all the easy points, essentially, all the points that are easy to classify get much lower weight. Uh, you get a lot more variance, a lot more variation in your ensemble, which gives you a much more nonlinear decision boundary in the end. And that's why boosting uh, does what it does. Uh, then there's the, this other variant of boosting called gradient boosting, which works slightly differently. Uh, and that's sort of more designed for regression models. So if you imagine this, this ADA boosting uh, or this, this standard boosting approach where you reweigh your models, if you try and translate that to regression, um, regression actually gives you more information. If you look at one classifier and you see what it does wrong on your data, you don't just get the instances that it gets wrong because it gets all instances wrong, right? There's no, or uh, usually a regression model has some error on every instance. Um, and then for every instance, you get a residual, the distance between the what the classifier said, sorry, the dis distance between what the model said, and the distance between the target output. So the intuition of gradient boosting in its simplest form is that you train and start with the classifier, which gives you some residuals, 
and then you train another, sorry, not a classifier, I'm mixing up my terminology. So you start with a regression model, which predicts an output, which gives you some residuals, some errors, and then you train another model to predict those residuals. And if you sum those models together, you get lower residuals than either of them uh, got. So that looks something like this. So I'll start with a constant model. Usually these uh, uh, boosting methods start with a constant model. We'll call that M0, and that gives us these residuals. So a constant model usually picks uh, the mean of the data if your loss function is squared errors. Uh, and then we train another model to, as it were, predict the residuals of the first model so that the sum of the two models looks like this. And here I've uh, used a, a regression stump, so a, a one-node one regression tree, which looks like this single step function. Um, and if we add the two together, we get this kind of thing, which gives us new residuals for this uh, sum of these two models. And then we can add another model that predicts those residuals, which might lead to a little refinement here, for instance. That's the basic idea of gradient boosting. Here's the algorithm. We uh, initialize our model with constant function. We compute all the residuals of the ensemble so far, which at first are just the residuals of the model, of the zero model. Then we fit a new model, MT, to the data set X, uh, to the data set X labeled with residuals instead of the original labels. And we add it to our ensemble weighted by uh, a value gamma. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's not really a, a neat way to determine gamma as there was in AdaBoost to determine this weight. So you can either use line search where you just sort of do a binary search over all the values to minimize the error. Or uh, what I've seen as well is that you can slowly decay gamma as a kind of learning rate. So you just, the more models you add, the lower this gamma gets. Uh, both methods seem to work. Uh, and again, we can write our model down recursively. So M3, <laughs> capital M3 is capital M2 plus another model. And what we see if we fill in M2, that we sort of slowly expand this sum. So the actual ensemble that we're looking at is just this sum of weighted models, like, uh, like it was in AdaBoost. So that's your basic gradient boosting, uh, which is sort of fairly straightforward and works very well. And you might be wondering why it's called gradient boosting. Uh, and in order to understand that, it's instructive to um, think about a, a slightly uh, strange, strange model. So imagine we have a, a machine learning model, a regression model, which is sort of designed to only overfit. It stores, it has a bunch of weights, W, vector of weights W. And for every instance in the data, it just stores one of these weights and outputs it. So instead of learning anything or computing a function, it just memorizes some output that it has for every instance in your data and it outputs that. So it's a sort of super overfitting model that you couldn't really even try on a test data set because it only has outputs for the training data. Um, so it's a very weird model, but it's instructive to think about it. Because if we try and work out the gradient on this model for uh, the uh, 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 sum of squared errors loss function, mean squared errors loss function, uh, what we see is this. We just uh, take the output of the model minus the target output squared, and we take the derivative over wi. And we've worked this out a couple of times already. So what we see is uh, there's a 2 missing here, but we can ignore that. Um, what we see is that the gradient is just wi minus yi. It's just the difference 
between the model output and the uh, uh, target output. In other words, the gradient is just the residual. The gradient in weight i is just the residual of instance i. Now, there's no models that work like this because it wouldn't work as a model, but in essence, um, what you're um, essentially doing uh, when you're doing gradient descent is you're computing this gradient, which is, as it were, a gradient in your prediction space, it's sometimes called. And you're telling your model to follow this gradient. And a model that has a, a separate free output for every instance can follow this gradient perfectly. And a model that's a little bit more constrained in what outputs it can generate, so a little bit more of a functioning model, can't quite follow this gradient. It can't quite optimize everything to follow this gradient. But you're telling it in gradient boosting, follow this gradient as well as you possibly can. Find whatever model you can in your model space that takes a step in the direction of this gradient. So in a slightly different notation, when we're doing gradient boosting, we're essentially computing the gradient of this. Um, remember to put the one half in front, so now it works out properly. We're computing the gradient of this loss function with respect to the model outputs. And that gives us a direction in this model space that we, uh, or in this prediction space that we can ask the model to follow. And the reason this is an interesting way to think about gradient boosting is because it allows us to replace this loss function with another loss function. Because so far, gradient boosting, as we've seen now, optimizes squared error loss. But we might want to optimize a different loss function. And if we do that, we can just compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the model output, for instance, xi. And we'll call that a pseudo residual. Because it doesn't actually, it might not actually work out as a, a genuine residual, as it does with um, the squared error loss. But if we take this gradient descent perspective, we can still follow, optimize to predict the pseudo residual, and it still works, and we still uh, get a, a useful function out of it. So, just one example. Uh, what if we want to optimize for the L1 loss instead of the uh, L2 loss? So L2 loss is this squared error that we've uh, been seeing so far. L1 loss is the same, but it doesn't square. It just takes the absolute value. So it just takes the distance between the model prediction, which I've called MI, just to simplify the nota notation a little bit just for this slide. So we call the model output MI and the target output YI. And just the distance between those two, the absolute value of the distance between those two, we call, uh, that's our loss. And that's what we're going to optimize. So if we now take the um, derivative of that value, that loss value, with respect to the model output, uh, we can apply the chain rule. So the derivative of the absolute function with respect to its argument times derivative of, MI, uh, of the, this uh, error over mi. Uh, so the part on the right just works out as 1. So that sort of disappears. And then for the absolute function, uh, that has a very simple derivative. Uh, so the absolute function looks like this. So it's just the identity function, except in the negative regime, we remove the minus, as it were. So it has two simple derivatives. On this side of the 0, it has derivative 1. And on this side of the zero, it has derivative of minus one. So we say that the derivative of the absolute function is the sine of its input. And the sine function just outputs one if the input is larger than one, larger than zero, sorry, and minus one if the input is smaller than zero. And I think zero if the input is exactly zero, but that doesn't usually happen. So what we see here, to roll back to the, the takeaway, is that if we um, want to do gradient boosting, but we want to optimize L1 loss instead of L2 loss, what we should do is compute, instead of the residuals, we should just compute the sign of the residuals. 
and then train our next classifier in the ensemble to predict not the residual, but the sign of the residual. And then we're optimizing L1 loss instead of L2 loss. And you can do this for any loss function, and it will give you the pseudo residuals, and you can train a gradient boosting algorithm that optimizes any uh, particular loss function. So just to compare gradient boosting and ADA boosts to uh, hopefully uh, contrast these things with, with each other a little bit. Basically, in gradient boosting, each model fits the pseudo residuals of the previous model, whereas in ADA boost, each model, each new model fits a reweighted data set. So we assign new weights on the data set based on how uh, well or badly the uh, previous model did on these instances. And uh, in ADA boost, each model refines its own reweighted loss. So we just uh, we, we train every new model with a specific loss function, and we tune that loss function based on the weights from the previous error. And in gradient boosting, every um, uh, we don't give the individual learners a loss function. So in gradient boosting, the individual learners might be learners that don't actually work on a loss function, like regression trees or regression stumps. Uh, but we just optimize a global loss, and instead we give the individual learners new training labels. And we sort of communicate the gradient to the individual learners through these uh, training labels, which means that gradient boosting works much better for uh, model families that don't optimize this, this loss function and don't work through this sort of calculus-inspired uh, learning method, which is another nice bonus for uh, gradient boosting. So that's all I had to say about boosting. Just uh, a couple more slides left for stacking, which is uh, much less math, I promise you. Uh, stacking is a very simple method, where basically, let's say you uh, were back to classification. We have a classification data set like this. And you train a bunch of models, and in stacking you don't have this ensembling method where you, where it's defined how you should train these models. It, it is an ensembling method, but you don't have this sequential method where you have to train your models in a certain way. You just do it yourself. You just say, I'm going to try one of these models, one of these models, and one of these models. And they all give you some outputs. So let's say you train three models. They all give you some classifications. And essentially what stacking does when it comes down to it is just takes these columns, adds them to the data set, and then trains another model on this data set. So you're sort of training a higher level model, usually a relatively simple model, to take the uh, sort of expert advice from, this, uh, from these uh, three other models, and depending on the rest of the features, it can sort of make decisions about which model to trust in which case. Usually the combiner, which is this last model, um, is something simple like logistic regression. Uh, and then basically you can draw it like this. So the data set goes into these three models. The judgments of these three models go into the combiner, possibly with the original features as well. And then the combiner outputs your, uh, uh, your final judgment. And the nice thing is if you do this with neural networks, or with any other kind of differentiable functions, then this whole thing just becomes one big neural network. So after training these three models and combining it into one bigger neural network, you could actually, if you want to, train the whole thing end-to-end -end as well, do backpropagation on the whole thing. So that's a nice thing about stacking. Um, and stacking, I think, is, is mostly used when you... Um, when you have a couple of models, like a handful of models that are pretty good already, but you want to combine them to, uh, let's say, win a Kaggle competition. Whereas these other methods, like boosting and bagging, are used when you have a model family that is very weak, and you want to turn it into a good model family, like decision sums. Um, but then when you have, uh, yeah, when you've, you've done your your Kaggle competition and you've come up with one or two good models and you want to combine those into an even better model, then you tend to go for something like stacking. So stacking is a little bit more of a modest approach of uh, just getting that extra little boost. Uh, 
Um, the final slide. Ensembling. So we um, just to reiterate, we tend to use ensembling a lot in production systems because they give you this little extra edge over individual models. Um, and in competitions, they're used a lot, like Kaggle. But we never use them in research. And in fact, the sort of most of the field of ensembling has been pretty well worked out. Because in research, we sort of we take it as read. We take it as given that. For any given model, you can always improve its performance a little bit if you apply some boosting or if you apply some bagging. Um, and what we want to do when we do research, we want to test the models in isolation. So we want to compare uh, two models to each other without boosting. So if you read machine learning research papers, there will never be any boosting because that sort of uh, just confounds the results. Um, so there's very sort of clear split between what we do in production and what we do in research. Uh, another thing to consider is that an ensembling can be expensive. You have this huge neural networks. They're not often, that often used in ensembles because then you need lots of copies of the new, huge neural networks. And that gets very expensive very quickly. Uh, so what you usually see is that ensembling is used more for very tiny models, like decision stumps or, or small uh, decision trees. Um, yeah, and just to reiterate, we have bagging and boosting. Bagging reduces variance, boosting reduces bias. And that's all I had for you today. Uh, I'll see you next Monday when we will talk about sequences, I think.